you see. Man, doesn't it feel good in the house of the Lord tonight? Oh, that's, that's what a Sunday night's supposed to feel like. We're not supposed to be sitting at home hiding from a hurricane. We're supposed to be in the house of the Lord worshiping God on a Sunday night. It's good to be back. You may be seated. Amen. Brother Strickland, come up. I've asked Brother Strickland to testify a little bit tonight. We're thankful for him and his great wife. If you love the Lord, shout amen. Amen. Turn around, look at your neighbor and say, give God your heart. Give God your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I know many of you are still communicating in the back, but that's okay. I just want to take a moment. Brother Tony asked me to testify. and Man. I thought about all the things in my life that's went on. I thought about everything. And the only thing I could come up with as a testimony is God has been faithful. Yeah. Despite what I've done, despite what the mistakes that I've made, despite everything that I've been through, God has been faithful. First Thessalonians says, faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. So I began to think about my life and a testimony that I could leave with you tonight. And, and I began to think about this shy, timid introvert that I was as a young man, as a young boy. I, I didn't really like to talk to people. I didn't like to be in front of crowds. I, I was very shy. And, uh, and, uh, but at 14 years old, I felt that God had called me for a purpose. And it called me to be a minister, to be a preacher. And it didn't quite turn out the way I thought it might turn out. And life happened. Anybody ever have that? Life happened to you? Yeah. Amen. And, and things happened in my family. It was brought me from, from where I was to this great church in 1989. I moved to this church. And uh, I just, I'm just thankful for what God has done. And uh, I want to thank Brother Arnold when we came, being so gracious. Brother Phil Holly, being so gracious to my family and I. And uh, Brother Mike Treadway, my friend, and, and got me involved with Bible quizzing. That's the reason I'm standing here today is because of God's faithfulness in Bible quizzing. I promise you that right now. He has been faithful to me. And, and, and so I had this calling. I had this, this desire to speak. And, and with everything that happened in my family, I said, Lord, I'll just serve you, God. I, I don't have to be a preacher. I don't want to be a preacher. I, there's no way. There's no how. I, I'm too timid. I'm too shy. It's okay, God. I'll just be a saint. I'll just sit on the pew. I'll pay my tithes. And I'll, 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 I'll just be here. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be faithful to you, God, because you've been faithful to me. And, and so for many years, here I was, just sitting on a pew. And, and God was faithful. God was faithful. And here I was. And, and I had a calling, but I, I said, you know, God, I don't want any part of that. It, there's too much pressure. There's too much, there's too much that goes on to be a minister. There's, there's too many attacks that come against you. There's too many things you have to battle with. God, I don't want to do that. But he's still faithful. So I sat in this pew in this church through my 20s and, and, and most of my 30s and well, not most. Part of my 30s. And, and I was a good person. I, I came to church. I did everything supposed to be right. But God still had a call that He wanted me to fulfill. He never, if He calls you, somebody, that call never stops. That, that call never goes away. That, that anointing that He places on you never vanishes. So if He's ever called you once, He's still calling you today. If you never answered the call once, He's calling you again today. So he was faithful. I struggled. I was up and down. I was, I was in here at the church, but many times I wasn't really in church. Everybody ever been there? Where you come to church, but yeah, yeah, you're not really there. But I just want to encourage you, don't ever leave the church. No matter how bad you feel, how tough the times may be, how hard it may be, how much you may feel like a hypocrite, don't ever walk away from the church. He was faithful. When I was unfaithful sometimes, He was faithful. When I didn't do what was right, He was faithful. Amen. God, You've been so good to me. Amen. November 19th, 2011. This is my testimony of God's faithfulness. November 19th, 2011. I got rushed to the hospital. Terrible pains in my stomach. Horrible. Everybody was... Worried and I was worried and 
I get to the hospital in North Florida and, and, and they wanted to try to do a, a, a flesh me out and do a scan, but they weren't able to do that. But they went in and they did a CAT scan and they, they saw on my intestine a big round mass. They didn't know what it was. They, they, they didn't know what it was. There was a big, just a big mass there in my colon and it had hogged me and, and it was just a horrible, painful thing. And uh, Sister Wendy could testify that she talked to the doctor that read the x-rays and he said, I'm 90% sure this is cancer. He's young, but I'm pretty sure this is colon cancer. And so, of course, you know, you say the C word, that freaks everybody out. Yeah. Amen. But little did they know I have a God who is faithful. So they rushed me into surgery on Friday. This was, that was a Thursday. On Friday, they rushed me into surgery. They re removed the part of my colon. They removed a part of my bladder. And, and they give me a colostomy bag. And here I lay in the hospital, 30-some years old, thinking I had cancer. Not really, but they said I had cancer. But I said, no, 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 no. I have a God that's too faithful to me than that. So we're praying and we're believing. And... and I never really, the, the oncologist come in and said, okay, well, when we get done with the surgery, now that we're done with the surgery, when they get the, the pathology reports back, you're going to have to go through this treatment and that treatment, and, and they're going to do this and this and this, and, and, and I said, I kind of just half listened, and, and I didn't really pay attention to what he had to, had to say, I just said, okay, whatever, and then, then Monday morning, we got the reports back from the doctor, and we were sitting in the room, and, and, and he, my doctor called me and said, I wanted to call you as soon as I could to let you know that you have no cancer. about God's goodness. I went back in a few months later in March to reconnect everything, get rid of the colostomy bag. And, and my uh, surgeon went in and he said, when we got done, he said, you know, I went ahead and took out your uh, appendix while we were there. I said, oh, gee, that's great. Just go ahead and take it out. He said, it's an extra 300 bucks. I said, hey, no problem. Plus money among friends, right? But anyway, so he took it out and he said, we did a, we did a search of your appendix and on the very tip of your appendix, there was a little tumor. And I really believe because I serve a faithful God that he took that big mass and he pushed it right down to a little tip of my appendix on the tumor and they pulled it out of my body. And I give God the glory. And I give God the praise. And I thank him for his faithfulness to me. He's faithful. So if you're struggling with something, if you're back something, if there's something going on in your life, don't ever forget that you serve a faithful God. He will be there in the time of trouble. He'll be there in the time of need. And we give God all the glory and all the praise. God bless you. Let us clap our hands and give God praise. Aren't you thankful we serve a faithful God? A healer, a deliverer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I got the great chance of spending some time Friday night with Brother Damon Watson and his uh, soon-to-be wife. Uh, who? What did I say? Oh, Dana Morgan. Sorry, I got. Yeah. So, but that get a rumor started right there. Right? Brother Morgan, I'm so sorry. I, I had it written down, but I brought, came over without my book. It's so nice to meet all of y'all. Six more months, I'm going to get half your names down. I had a great chance to meet, to, to meet with uh, the uh, Morgans. And, uh, his soon-to-be wife, next month. And, uh, after talking with them, I don't give them six months. But we're going to enjoy them the six months that they're married. I've asked her to sing tonight, and she'll be joining our church next month when they get married. Would you put your hands together, let's receive Sister soon to be Amber Morgan.
37 times in the entire King James Bible. 30 of those found in the book of Genesis. So it's almost like after Genesis, he is just kind of forgotten about. His name is mentioned twice in Deuteronomy, once in Psalms, twice in the Gospel of Luke, and once in 2 Peter. If Abraham, his uncle, is called the father of the faithful, then Lot can be called the father of the barely saved. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I do intend on preaching, but I also intend on building a foundation in which to preach a little bit. But So I want to say this. Not everyone is called to be a pioneer or to be an explorer in life. I'll even take it a step further. Not everyone is called to achieve what we would call greatness in life. Now, we're all called to do something. There are great, powerful, historical men such as Abraham. And then there are those of us who are to follow along in what I would call supporting roles. To help men like Abraham fulfill what God would have them to fulfill. And while doing that, really fulfill what we are called to fulfill. As well. Lot was such a man. If only Lot would have ended as he had begun, he would have had a great testimony. And thus it is with life. And let me remind you of the old saying, it is not how we start that counts, but it is how we finish that really matters. 
if Lot would have been content to share the prospects and the peace and the prosperity of Abraham, his life would have turned out far less tragic than it did. He would have escaped many trials and sorrows by just staying connected to Abraham. Now I can't spend a lot of time here, but to paint the picture maybe a little clearer, let me say like this. Every sun and every moon needs a sky full of stars to really set them off. Amen. That's good. Out of all the stars in the sky, there is only one sun and one moon for our earth, yet there are many stars. You see, God may not have called me to be the greater light or even what Scripture calls the lesser light. But if I can just accompany those lights, then I will be doing my part to the best of its ability. Amen. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but I believe that was a word from the Lord for somebody. Amen. You don't have to be the top dog to still be part of the plan of God. So, we can learn a lot from Lot. The first thing we can learn from Lot is that independence is not necessarily freedom. Independence is not necessarily freedom. Lot should have remained faithful to work under Abraham rather than trying to compete with or live on the same level as Abraham. And if he had done this, then instead of being barely saved, he would have been abundantly saved. Right. Instead of having to deal with the smell of fire and brimstone in his clothes, he would have been able to watch from a distance. Instead of being lost in the mountains and in some unmarked grave, he could have been given the honor of a patriarch's burial. Amen. Could it be that some of us are putting ourselves through things that we shouldn't have to go through? But because we're too stubborn to recognize and respond to the truth that we might not be the sun and we might not be the moon, but yet the Bible is clear in Genesis 1 and 16 that God made the stars also. Amen. And we may not be as bright as that and we may not be as big as this, but we're still part of the sky and we're still part of God's handiwork. You don't have to run the church to be part of the church. You shouldn't have to feel like you've got to be on some board or some committee to feel accomplished. You just need to be thankful that God saved you and brought you into the family of God. I may not be a preacher, but I can drive a van. And I may not be a Sunday school teacher, but I can open the door for somebody. Didn't he just say no matter what happens, just stay in the church. Just stay connected to the kingdom of God. 
Don't get your eyes on some junk out there that you have no business looking at that's going to lure you out of the kingdom. Lot wanted freedom. Sounds like an 18 year old. I can't, I'll be yes, out of this stupid house. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Some of the dumbest people I've ever met in my life. I'm glad when I can pay my own bills. You don't even know what you're saying. You can pay your bills right now if you had to. You better thank God for them dumb mom and daddies that sit there. God wanted freedom. You gotta have freedom. You gotta get out from under this bondage. But that freedom turned into a servant of sin. Right. But had he remained a faithful servant to Abraham, then he could have continued to experience what we would call freedom. Right. Yes. The Apostle Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 6 Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that we were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. Yes. You become servants of righteousness. Right. Yes. So you become free from this only to become a servant to something else. Right. So this Amen. is what, I, whatever, this is for somebody. I'm not going to say it's not, because God told me to tell somebody. So here's what I want you to grab. Yeah, there I'm it is. Right now. We're never going to be free. Right. Amen. That's right. We are either going to be free from sin by becoming a servant of righteousness. Right. Yes. Or you're going to be free from righteousness by becoming a servant of sin. But all of this, well, I just can't wait for my freedom. Freedom itself, by itself, cannot be sustained. Amen. You can't help but read the story a lot and see the dangers of half-heartedness and complacency and apathy in life. And, and, and I want to tell you today that the most serious and the most important thing that we will ever do is not, and, and listen, God has blessed this church with some extremely educated people and we're thankful for that. Yes, sir. But that's not going to be your greatest accomplishment. It's not going to be to win America's most prestigious awards. It's not going to be to drive a $100,000 car. It's not the most greatest thing you ever do is not going to climb the ladder of success in whatever career or company that you work with. The greatest, serious, and most important thing that you will ever do is when you turn from your sinful ways and repent of your sins and get water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and let God fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the greatest thing. That's the greatest accomplishment. I don't care if Caitlin's not ever voted in most important anything. I know she's saved. I know she's on her way to heaven. And as long as I can get my family through the pearly gates and hear and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, I am a success. We need to quit trying to please everybody. were saved through Noah's ministry. Right. Right. Brother Arnold said this the other day at lunch. One of those sermon thoughts. When I start traveling out preaching a little rally here or something, they're going to think I've started praying. I just had lunch with the bishop. Just what Brother Arnold said. Brother Arnold said that Noah went in the boat as the minority. But it came out after the storm as the majority. I don't know what you're going through right now, but if you'll go through it with God when it's all said and done, you may feel like the whole world's against you, but when you come out on the other side. Noah only had eight people in his church, but I would say he was a success. And all Sodom needed was ten people. And God said, I'd spare the whole city. 
city if I just had 10 righteous people. 10 righteous people can handle a city of wicked perversion. If I just had a home missionary, if I just had a storefront, if I just had a church of 10 people, I believe those 10 people could impact that whole sinful city. Don't you sit there and think we can't do something in this city and in this region. We've got more than 10. This is Genesis chapter 13. Lot lifted his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's funny how things look before. Right. Look good now, but there's destruction coming. Verse 11 says, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Another thing we can learn from Lot is that you can't always go by what looks good, what looks right, or what looks bad. Now the church is in competition for a lot of things, with a lot of things. The church is in competition with the NFL, the NBA, TBN, NASCAR. The church competes with the lake, with Bodie with weekend getaways. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff. Until it starts looking more enticing right. than church. Right. Amen. Until we start choosing it over church. Right. Until we spend more time with it than we do church. Right. Lot looked around. Uh -huh. And Lot said, I get to choose Abraham. Uncle Abraham, you going to let me choose? Yeah. And, and I've got the rocky, barren terrain over here. And I've got this beautiful green grass, well-watered plains over here. Are you sure, Uncle Abraham? Is your eyes fell? You going to leave it up to me? Never one time do you see where Lot prayed, where Lot built an altar, right. where Lot talked to God. Lot just looked at what looked good. Right, wow. amen. Uh -oh. And he said, I'll choose this because it looks good right now. And he chose the well watered plains, which were soon to become the well wasted plains. Hear me tonight. I don't care how enticing this world looks. I don't care how bright their lights are. How nice their clubs are. How many people they are attracting. I've read the back of the book. This thing's going to end the same way it ended for Sodom and Gomorrah. And we can learn a lot from Lot. Just because the grass looks greener doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Just because that way looks easier doesn't it's going to stay that way. That's right. Come on, let's, let's just be real for a few minutes. How many of us have made decisions that felt good to the flesh? It looked good to the pocketbook. It just seemed like everything was going to be all right. Hey, you got in the middle of it, thought, why in the world? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. People do that all the time. People move cross country because of a job without even knowing is there a church. But I'll just go because it's going gonna, it's gonna to help me and it's going to be good now and it's, it's well watered now. We can learn a lot from Lot. The grass may be greener on the other side but the water bill is usually higher too. Look at your neighbor and say we can learn a lot from Lot. 
Bible declares to us that Lot lifted up his eyes and looked to the well water plains. It was beautiful. It was a great place. It would have been a perfect spot for his flocks. Everything about Jordan was perfect. Everything about his choice looked good. Except down the road, there were two cities named Sodom and Gomorrah. See, a lot of us are making choices now that look like they have no consequences. But they're putting us on a road that if we don't make a U-turn, in a few years, we're going to be we're going to be part of a system that we were never supposed to be a part of. And the choices that he made in life were going to mark him and mar him. Another thing we can learn from Lot is what a man chooses and how a man chooses proves a lot about his character. Come on. Opportunities, alternatives, choices placed before men, women, will allow certain discoveries of our character to come to light. Lot chose the good ground, the good water, the good pasture. At the very cost of disgrace, self-centeredness, worried about himself, kind of probably chuckling that his uncle got stuck with the barren, rocky, hilly terrain. Amen. <laughs> oh, Uncle Abe ain't as good as he used to be. <laughs> but the most important thing to Lot is the fact that his cattle are going to be up to their bellies in grass. Their herd is going to be growing by leaps and bounds. His account's going to get bigger and bigger. Oh, sure, it was in the neighborhood of Sodom, but God understands that I have to be successful. I'll be able to be successful here and still live for God and Sodom and Gomorrah will not affect me and Sodom and Gomorrah is not going to impact my kids and, and it's the best move for us at this time. You better look down the road and see where this move is going to put you. I'm sure you've heard the statement before that some people are too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Well, Lot had just the, the opposite problem. He was too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good. Right. Amen. You see, one of the most crucial times in a person's life is when they're trying to choose which city they will pitch the direction of their tent. Right. Amen. And too many times those choices are made as if the history of Lot had never been written. But I want you to understand, we can learn a lot from Lot. Yep. Genesis chapter 13 verse 12 and Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. And that would be okay if it wasn't for verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Even though he was aware of the danger. Even though he was aware of the pitfall. Even though he had heard the preacher preach about the danger of getting on that path. He was aware of the sin and the wickedness. He still pointed his tents in that direction. And you might be thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with this. But the truth must be revealed when you turn to from Genesis chapter 13 and verse 12, if you'll flip over a few pages to Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 12, he's not even near the city limits. That's right. But by chapter 19 verse 1, he's now a resident of the city. Right. And not just a resident, but, the, but by the fact that he was sitting in the gate of the city lets us know that he was in some type of leadership position of the city. Amen. So he didn't just move there, he got involved. Right. Yep. Yep. Amen. 
And I think if we were all to be honest tonight, we'd have to admit that many of our choices we make out of pride or selfishness or out of our own lust, that those choices usually put us and our families in positions that we should have never been in. It's like a poem I read one time said, One ship drives east and the other drives west with the selfsame wind that blows. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales which tells us the way to go. One of the biggest, one of the thing, one of the most important things that we can learn from Lot is whichever direction our tent is pointed is the direction in which we are headed. It matters not how hard the wind is blowing in your life. It matters not if all the odds are stacked up against you. You set your sail in the right direction, and there's not a devil in hell that can stop you from ending up where God wants you. You can be the poorest person from the worst part of the neighborhood, but you pitch your tents toward God, and I promise you every single day, you'll inch a little closer to God. But you can have the, be from the best family in the church, and you point your tents toward the world, and it's just a matter of time before you get further and further away from the church. I've come to wake us up tonight and tell you, like I said this morning, the Lord is coming up. If there's ever been a time that we're looking up to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, it is now. Some of you thinking, yeah, but I'm in the church, I'm okay, but you hear me. Your location is not near as important as your direction. That's right. Because you can be sitting in a church tonight listening to an extremely good looking preacher preach. And doesn't know anybody's name. But your tents can be pointed in the opposite direction. And yet there's somebody sitting in a bar room. And they don't know how they're going to get it all figured out. But they're tired of it. And their tents are now pointed toward the church. I would dare say I'll put all my money on the guy in the bar room than I would the person that's sitting in the church. Because the location is not really important. It's the direction in which you are headed. You still got some rough edges, but if you keep headed in the right direction, you're not gonna find nobody to beat you up and to try to judge you and condemn you. We're just gonna tell you, make sure you keep headed in the right direction. There is a crown of life laid up for you. If you'll just get up every day and put one foot in front of the next one and say, I will live for God today. I will be victorious today. I refuse to let the world. Chapter 19, verse 1 says, And there came two angels at Sodom and Enon, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. Now listen to this. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Even in that sinful place, Lot could recognize the presence of God. He knew. Uh, this is not just anybody. This is, a, this is a manifestation. This is a visitation. And he bowed himself. You know what you call that? You call that mercy. Right, Anytime right. you're involved in junk you shouldn't be involved in and you can still recognize when God walks in the place. Yes. Yes. That's called mercy. Amen. You may be living in sin today, but if you can recognize His presence tonight, then you can experience His mercy. Right. Another thing we can learn from Lot is the fact that once you get deeply involved with sin, that there's nothing you will not do. When Lot, Lot first pointed his tents towards Sodom, I would, I would venture to say that he said he would never live there. Because he knew who lived there. But yet, all of a sudden, he ended up there. And his family ended up there. Once he was in Sodom, he continued to not think about the welfare of his family. Lot is now some type of leader in this particular city. Think about that. How, how do you get this involved in such a sinful place? The answer is simple. One step at a time. This is how you live for the Lord. The Bible says little by little. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. 
the Lord told the, the, the children of Israel, He said, I'm not going to drive out all the inhabitants of the land. I'm going to drive them out little by little. You're going to possess the promised land. That was a great typology of how we're going to be victorious and living for God. It's not just, God's not going to give you everything you need the first time you come to an altar. But if you just keep living for God, it's little by little. It's line upon line. It's precept upon precept. It's here a sermon, there a sermon. Old MacDonald had a farm. Come on. And that's the, same, that's the way we live for God. That's the same way we backslide. We backslide little by little. We backslide in increments. Right. Right. Sin is a slow process. Backsliding is a gradual slide that is easily justifiable. The men of Sodom came to his house. Now, now I want you to get this. He invites God's presence to come into his house. The men of Sodom come to his house to rape the two angels. And I want you to notice what Lot did. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 19, verse 4, But before they lay down, the men in the city, even the men of Sodom, could pass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Don't do this. Behold now. Now this is a daddy speaking. I don't get this. Because you ever want to mess with my daughter and I'll hurt you. Amen. I'll kill you and I'll get up and preach a sermon as soon as I shoot you. Come on. I'll be just as anointed then as I've been any other time. Don't mess with my family. Amen. So I don't understand this perverted way of thinking. He said, I tell you what I'll do. I've got two daughters, which you've never known a man. And here's what I'll do. Let, I pray, let me, let me bring them out unto you. And listen to his words. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore they come under the shadow of my roof. Now I want you to understand. We can learn a lot from Lot. He first had no respect for Abraham. Then he had no problem choosing the better looking piece of property. He then pointed his tents towards Sodom. He then was setting in the gates of the city. He's now offering his daughters to the perverts of the city. Right. Lot became so desensitized to the sins around him that he was willing to sacrifice his kids instead of admitting that he was in the wrong spot. Amen. Amen. Wow. We can learn a lot. Anytime we don't stand for what's right, we always risk our families. The last thing we need to do on this eve of the coming of the Lord, this, this soon to, to, to appear rapture of the church, the last thing that we need to do is become so desensitized that we're willing to sacrifice our kids without ever thinking anything about it. That, that, that we're willing to put our children into harm's way just so we can satisfy our own desires and our own lust. Amen. You know, we're a, a day late or a week late on Grandparents' Day, but as parents and grandparents, we better monitor everything that comes across yeah. the television, the internet, and any movies that we stream into our house. Well, hello. We need to know what kind of music they're listening to. If your kid's got a phone and you don't know the password, you are a horrible parent. Amen. Come on. No, I'm going to take it a step further. You're a foolish parent. Come on. You might ought to go to jail for child abuse. We cannot sacrifice our kids at the altar of convenience. We cannot. I used to tell Caitlin all the time as a teenager, I don't trust you. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how sweet you are. I don't care that you know how to say all the right things. I don't trust you because you're a teenager and because you're fleshly and because I know what teenagers think. I don't trust you. Give me your phone. Let me check what's going on. Let me look at your history. Let me take it away from you. Let me do it. What do you say? Oh, you're invading her privacy. Nonsense. That's a political mumbo jumbo. That's going to cripple my society. You're being a parent. I 
would dare say right now, word. there's more pornography in this church house. Right now. Right. On cell phones in this building right now. Right. That if God were to judge us, if He were to mark our iniquities, who could stay? Come on. We need holy families in this last day that will say this is not what we're supposed to live. This is not how we're supposed to live. We're going to turn our backs and get out of this place. Amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Now, amen. I want you to this. I want you to, I don't think this is a far stretch. Here angels show up. A manifestation shows up. A divine visitation happens. And the men of Sodom didn't mind them being there. They didn't want to run them out of town. They didn't necessarily want the presence to leave. They just wanted to pervert the presence to become like they were. Right. They wanted the benefits of that presence, but they didn't want to change their lifestyle. Right. As a matter of fact, they wanted the men from heaven to become like them instead of them becoming like the men from heaven. And there's a spirit in our world today that doesn't want to change. We want the Spirit of God. We want the presence of God. We want the power of God. We want all the benefits that come with that, but we don't want to change. We want His divine visitation to come in, but we don't want to change. And we we got to we gotta rebuke that spirit. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the old bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish but they put new wine in the new bottles when you get the Holy Ghost you gotta let God change you when you get ready to turn up you gotta be willing to change you can't come into the kingdom of God and still want to be like the world and act like the world and love the world that's foolish amen amen God don't you dare give your kids to those perverts right don't you dare, apostolic parents, give your kids to Hollywood. Give your kids over to the music industry. They smote the men that were at the door with blindness, both small and great. They weary to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thy house in the city? Bring them out of this place. I want you to get this. The purpose of the angel showing up. I know I'm young, but I got high mileage. I'm old fashioned inwardly. The purpose that for the angels to show up, the purpose of the supernatural for that day, the purpose of the divine visitation that day was so they could hear the message leave this place. That's why we feel the presence of God so strong in this place. God doesn't show up like He showed up this morning and like He showed up tonight so we can feel comfortable in our sin. But every time there's a divine visitation like that, somewhere there's a message to somebody. Come on. Come on. You don't have to stay here. You don't have to dwell there. You don't have to live in that side of town anymore. God wants to deliver you. God wants to save you. God wants to forgive you. Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. And Lot went out and spake to his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Now listen to this. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. The word mocked there means to laugh at. They didn't even take him seriously. He came and said, Hey, the Lord's about to destroy this place. <laughs> he just looked at that. He said, we've got business here. Don't let those old people that showed up tonight, those two men, get you all scared. We're good. Lot, you're the one who brought us here. Right. Come on. Come on. And now you're trying to tell us to leave. I'm going to beg somebody tonight. Don't backslide. Come on. Don't backslide because it's going to mess up your kids. Don't backslide because it, wait, it, don't, just, it, don't backslide because it's going to mess up your kids and, and you're going to pull your kids out of church and, and then when you get ready to come back to the church, they may look at you and mock you and laugh at you and go, well, right? Right. That's true. We can learn a lot from a lot. Even after the destruction had been spelled out to him, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 19, verse 16, that Lot lingered. Lot lingered. Lot 
linger. The angels had to forcefully remove him from his place. Why in the world would you linger in a place that God's getting ready to destroy? Why in the world would you linger in a pew when you know you need to be in an altar? Right. Amen. Amen. Why would you linger away from the house of God when you know that you need to be in the house of God? We can learn a lot. There's no need to dwell. There's no need to linger. There's no need to postpone it anymore. Then Lot prayed this little pitiful prayer in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 20. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. Let me escape hither. My soul shall live. Let me, let me get the Lord told him, say, get to the mountains. Get to the mountains. And, and he got tired of the journey, and he said, well, just let me, let me just go right here. Zoar, I'll just go right here. Zoar means little. Anytime you stop short of doing what God wants you to do, you'll always dwell in the land of the little. Amen. That's right. And there's too many Pentecostals that's dwelling at the base of the mountain because we're too lazy to get up and climb the mountain. Woo! All right, Cal. Let's all stand. We can learn a lot. A lot. When God calls us to the mountains, let's not camp out in so far place of little commitment. A place of just barely getting by. We can learn a lot from Lot. Freedom isn't always liberty. Lot wanted to do his own thing and not serve Abraham. God give us people who have a servant's heart. Number two, you can't go by what looks good or what looks better than something else. God's ways are not man's ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. What a man chooses proves a lot about his character and integrity. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Number four, we can learn that where your tent is pointed is where you and your family are headed. I'm telling you, I've been pastoring for 18 years and it's never failed. I've seen people, they were in church, they were still being used, they were still, they were still had, had, had a ministry, they still had a position, but man, they're, somehow they got turned. Yep. Didn't know when. Hoped it wouldn't be. But you know, when you go, when you get into your car tonight, you're gonna go the direction right. that your car is going. Right. Yep. Not, not any of you are gonna get in your car and drive in reverse all well. Right. It's just it's, it's a simple point, but whichever way you're looking. That's the way you're going. Looking unto Jesus. Right. That's the way I'm going. Look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That's the way. Wherever your tent is pointed is where your family's headed. We learn that it doesn't pay to be selfish and self centered. We learn that he was not concerned about exposing his family to the sin of that city around them. There were no walls or protection. Let me just say this in passing. If you're waiting on the church to set every standard for your family, shame on you. There just ought to be some things that you just won't do in your house because you're godly people, not because the pastor asked you not to. Amen. He became desensitized to the things around him. That's why 20 years ago, when the homosexual agenda wanted to be introduced, they would, you know, every gay person or person that was insinuated as being gay on television was always the cool, the sharp dress, the funny, the one that, well, they were, they were making sure that they were getting a message. In this world is is deceiving people by the droves. Amen. Let's not let Holy Ghost filled people be one of them. Right. Amen. He became desensitized to the things. Even after the warning, he still lingered in Sodom. The last thing we learned from Lot is. He stopped short of the place that God had for him. He 
he was willing to settle for a little. And God said, I want you to get to the mountain. Right. And maybe, just maybe, had he gotten to the mountain, his daughters wouldn't have got him drunk. Right. Right. And had a baby from their own father. Maybe the Moabites would have never been birthed had somebody just been obedient to the voice of God. I know it's a cute little title, but there's truth to it. Amen. We can learn a lot from God. Right. Maybe there's somebody here tonight on this Sunday night who needs to, to walk out of this place refocused. Yes. Maybe you need to change the path that you're currently on. Maybe you realize that you've allowed some things to come into your home that has no business being in your home. Yes. Maybe your tents are pointed in the wrong direction. Maybe you're more worried about the green grass than you are the rocky terrain. See, he didn't even want the mountain when he chose that, so why would he want to climb it when he was trying to escape? At some point, we have to just be obedient to the Lord. Yes. You don't have to let, let your family get entrenched in this perverted world. Right. We need some strong fathers and husbands that will stand up and say like Joshua did, ask for me in my house. We will serve the Lord. Amen. And if you're here and you're a single mom, we need you to raise up and let God anoint you as a handmaiden of the Lord. Yeah. To say, I will step up and do what I need to do to protect my family, protect my children. And make sure we don't get entrenched. Oh, God, we don't need to linger. When we hear the Spirit pulling on our hearts, don't linger. Today is a day of salvation. Right now is the accepted time. Lift your hands up all over this place. Sunday night, we've had a great expression of worship. We've had great singing, great testimony. But now I think the only thing that's missing, we had a prayer room full of people. But I think now the best way to end this night is just gather around this front with your hands raised toward heaven and just take this little Bible study, this sermon tonight and learn some things from Lot and make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that somebody else has already made. And every dad ought to be up here praying for his family. Every mom ought to be in this altar praying for her family. Every grandparent ought to be in this altar saying, God, you've got to save my family. Let's not get entrenched in this world that when a preacher preaches on the coming of the Lord that there's mockery and there's laughing going, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We can learn a lot from Lot.